Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 99 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. If you're listening to the podcast a couple weeks ago, you heard me tell Peter Konechny that I am working on a new book, and it's called How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life. And because I am neck deep in this book, it's due in just over a week, I figured this would be a good time to do a medieval story time with you instead of having an interview. So for this research that I'm doing for this book, I had to do a lot of digging into primary sources. So monks actually speaking about their experience or their philosophy about what it was like to live in a monastery in the Middle Ages. And one of the sources that I came across that I really enjoyed was one called The Dialogue of Miracles by a monk named Caesarius. So Caesarius lived in the late 12th century and early 13th century, and he was a prior and the master of novices at an abbey called Heisterbach Abbey. And a prior is somebody who is kind of second in command to the abbot. When you're looking at monasteries, the abbot is meant to act like a father to all the brothers who are in the monastery. The prior is meant to act like the mother. So the abbot is involved in the really important stuff that has to deal with people who are outside the abbey. The prior really takes care of the brothers like their children. He intercedes with them on behalf of the brothers when the abbot is getting harsh with them and things like that. He takes care of them. And so in his capacity as a master of novices and a prior, he collected all these stories that were useful in helping novices to understand their theology better and to understand basically how God works and how miracles work. And he collected these together. He put them together into 12 books and they each have a different theme. I'm going to be reading some of these miracle stories to you because uh, they're just ones that I enjoyed over the course of my research and I thought they would be fun for you. They are not going to be in order. <laughs> I, I put them in my own order, uh, in order that I thought would make sense to this episode. But you can find this book online. We'll give you the link to it and you can read it in order if you like. It's very long. There are lots of miracle stories, but they are very fun. I wanted to give you Caesarius' own introduction so that you could kind of get a sense of his aims when he was writing this book and also his methodology because... It's really similar to a lot of other works that people were writing as instructional works in the Middle Ages. So as a prologue to this work, Caesarius gives us a, a scriptural quote, which says, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And then he starts his prologue like this. It has been my duty in my responsible post to rehearse to the novices some of those miracles that have been wrought within our order in our own times and are still of daily occurrence and I have been asked with much insistence by many to perpetuate them in writing, for they said that it would be an irrevocable loss if those accounts should fall into oblivion, which might serve for the edification of posterity. Although I felt myself unfitted to do this, both because of my scanty knowledge of the Latin tongue and my fear of the detractions of the envious, yet the commands of my abbot were laid upon me, together with the advice of the abbot of Marienstadt, and these it was impossible to gainsay. Mindful also of the saying of the Savior, which I have quoted, while others are breaking whole loaves to the people, that is, are expounding hard problems of scripture or writing down the more important occurrences of modern days, I have collected the crumbs that fell and have filled twelve baskets with them for those who are poor not in grace but in learning. For under that number of heads I have divided the whole work. The first book treats of conversion, the second of contrition, the third of confession, the fourth of temptation, the fifth of demons, the sixth of the virtue of simplicity, the seventh of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the eighth of the various visions, the ninth of the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, the tenth of miracles, the eleventh of the dying, and the twelfth of the pains and glories of the dead. Now that I might arrange my examples the more effectively, I have introduced, in the manner of a dialogue, two persons, to wit, a novice who asks questions, and a monk who gives the answers, because when the name of the author is withheld, the tongue of the detractor finds nothing to feed upon. Nevertheless, if any desire to know his name, let him put together the initial letters of the twelve books. I have also inserted accounts of a great number of events that took place outside the order, because they were edifying, and were, like all the rest, related to me by religious men. God is my witness that I have not fashioned from imagination one single chapter in this dialogue. Moreover, if any of the details happen otherwise than I have set down, the responsibility must lie on those who narrated them to me. And because this dialogue contains so many miracles, I have called it the Dialogue of Miracles. 
So there's a lot in here that's really familiar if you've read medieval stuff before. One saying that he he wasn't going to write it because he's not all that important and his learning is not that great, but he was convinced because of his importance. Another thing is the consideration for posterity. So he's actually writing this for us, for our edification, as well as all the novices as well. He has it in the form of a dialogue because question and answer was, I mean, how people learned in the Middle Ages. And so this is kind of a familiar setup for people. And then you have, of course, a whole list of things that are important for novices to learn about everything from confession to the Virgin Mary's miracles and things like that. The first miracle story I'm going to tell you today is about a student who lived in Paris. There were a whole lot of students in Paris. That's why there's a whole section of Paris that's still called the Latin Quarter because of all of the students that were speaking Latin and learning Latin there. So this is about a student who's led a very debauched life, as many students were accused of doing. But this student actually feels very sorry for the sins he's committed and things turn out well for him. So this is a really important story for Caesarius to tell. It's in his section on contrition that's really emphasizing the fact that if you're going to be forgiven, you actually have to be really sorry for your sins. So here is the story of a student from Paris. It is now 22 years, more or less, since I came to the order in the year of our Lord, 1199. And it was in that same year that there happened in Paris the events that I'm about to relate, which were told me by men both religious and learned, such as abbots and scholastici. There was a certain student there who, at the suggestion of our mortal enemy, had committed such sins that from very shame he could not confess to any mortal man. Yet, while he thought upon the torments of hell prepared for the wicked and the inconceivable joys of eternal life awaiting the righteous, and while he trembled every day lest the judgment of God should fall upon him, he was so tormented by the stings of conscience that he began visibly to waste away in body. What need of more? At last, in God's mercy, his shame was overcome by that serviceable fear which is able to draw charity after it, as the cobbler's bristle draws the thread. He went to St. Victor and asked for the prior and signified that he had come to make his confession. He, always ready for that duty, as are all the brethren of that monastery, came at once, took his seat in the customary place, and after a preliminary exhortation, waited in silence for the youth to begin. Then a wonderful thing happened. The merciful Lord, whose nature is goodness, whose will is power, and whose work is compassion in that same hour, poured into his heart so deep a flood of contrition, that as often as he began his confession, so often did his voice fail entirely, broken by sobs and sighs. Tears were in his eyes, sighs in his breast, sobs in his throat. When the prior saw this, he said to the student, Go and write out your sins upon a sheet of paper and bring it to me. Gladly he took the advice, withdrew, wrote, and the next day came back. When he tried again to make his confession, he failed as before, and when he found it impossible to speak, he held out the paper to the prior. The prior read it and was aghast at what he read, and he said to the youth, I cannot of myself advise you. May I show this to the abbot? And the other assented. The prior went to the abbot and gave him the paper to read, laying the whole case before him in due order. What happened then, let sinners hear and take comfort. Let even the desperate take new life and hope. As soon as the abbot unfolded the paper to read, he found its whole contents expunged. And the abbot said to the prior, What am I to read in this paper? There is nothing written on it. When the prior heard this, he looked at the paper with the abbot and said, I can assure your fatherliness that this youth wrote out an account of his sins upon this paper and that I read it myself before I gave it to you. But it is clear, surely, that the most merciful God has given heed to his intense contrition, and in his justice has blotted out his sin as already sufficiently punished, since indeed the deleting of all the writing signifies the deleting of all the sin. Then they sent for the student and showed him the paper, telling him that God had blotted out all his sin. When he had looked at it and recognized by certain marks that it was indeed the same, his heart was as much dilated with excess of joy as it had been contracted by excess of grief. They laid no penance upon him, but advised him how he might show gratitude to God for his great goodness and live carefully for the rest of his life. Behold how that youth, as is plain to see, though far from perfect before his great sin, fell indeed, but rose again perfected. So I like this story for a bunch of different reasons. First of all, students are always getting in trouble for leading these degenerate lives. And here's a story of one who is contrite. For it and things turn out like I said he's 
he's forgiven his sins. I also like this one because a student is going to be in his late teens or early 20s, and a prior is going to be around 40. Caesarius is around 40 when he became a prior. And yet this student's confession is shocking the prior to the point that he actually needs the help of the abbot to help uh, allow this student to be forgiven and give him the correct penance. So this is a, a story that kind of amuses me a little bit, but it's also one that's really important to the entire theology behind confession, contrition, and forgiveness. This next story is not so much a miracle as a, just a short, funny story that is meant to show people just how great Jesus is and how forgiving he is. Now, when we look at the Middle Ages, a lot of people think of the church as being extremely intolerant. You know, they will point at the Crusades or they will point at Inquisition. And in some cases, the church was very unforgiving, but those are specific cases and shocking cases. In many cases, you can't really control how people are going to be accessing their faith in real life. And so you can't bring the hammer down on them hard, uh, especially if they don't have terrible intentions in how they are maybe accidentally blaspheming. So this is the story of a lay brother. When monks were living their ordinary lives, they often had servants or they had lay brothers who would live with the monastic community and not take vows, but live a moral life like the monks did. So this is a story of a lay brother who maybe misunderstands the way that he's supposed to interact with Jesus. A certain simple lay brother in Hemen Road was very grievously tempted, and once, as he stood in prayer, he used the following words, Indeed, Lord, if thou dost not deliver me from this temptation, I will complain of thee to thy mother. The merciful Lord, who is the master of humility and the lover of simplicity, forestalled the complaint of the lay brother, as if he feared to be accused to his mother, and immediately made his temptation easier. There was another lay brother standing behind him at the time, and when he heard this prayer, he smiled and told the two others to edify them. So and this is a funny story about a lay brother asking Jesus to help him or else he's going to tattle on him to the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Obviously, the other brother thought this was funny too. And, and he told the story not to get the lay brother in trouble, but as a teaching story to show just how merciful Jesus can be, even if you kind of mess up when you ask for his help. The next story is a miracle story, and it's about someone who also does not ask for help in the way that she probably should ask for help, although you'll see that her circumstances are pretty stressful, so maybe she should be forgiven for that as Mary forgives her. So here's an example of a miracle that is based around a woman who has given the right amount of devotion to a statue of the Virgin Mary and Jesus that has been made really badly, but the woman is still devout enough to give it respect, at least at first. In the aforesaid fort, there lived an honorable and devout matron named Utah. Once, when she had sent her little daughter into the neighboring town to be brought up, and the child, who was now three years old, was playing in an open space, a wolf was seen by several people to seize her by the throat in her play, and throwing her over his back to set out for the woods close at hand. Many ran after him with cries, but returned sadly without having rescued the little girl. One of them ran to the castle, and telling the mother, who was sitting at the table of the carrying off of her daughter, said, "'Madam, a wolf has eaten your daughter!' to whom she very much angered, replied, Of a surety no wolf has eaten my daughter. Nevertheless, she immediately rose from the table, and entering the chapel in great bitterness of heart, tore the image of the Saviour from his mother's lap, and standing opposite her and weeping bitterly, she broke out into these words, Lady, never shall you have your son back again unless you restore to me my child unhurt. Wonderful humility of the Queen of Heaven! As if she feared to lose her son if the woman did not recover her daughter, she forthwith laid her orders upon the wolf who let the girl go. Many from the town were following the tracks of the wolf in order that they might bury the remains of the child, and found her running about near a certain copse. And when they said to her, Where have you come from, little girl? She replied, Mumart has bitten me, for the marks of the wolf's teeth in her throat showed clearly on the surface of her skin, and they are there to this day as a witness of so great a miracle. Then they took the child to her mother, who, as soon as she saw her safe and sound, ran joyfully to make an act of thanksgiving to the sacred image. And putting back the child into her lap, she said, Because thou hast given me back my daughter, lo, I restore to thee thy son. This was told me by Hermann, the abbot of Marienstadt, whom I have so often mentioned, and who saw the girl and heard from the mouth of the mother all that I have told. 
So here's a story of a woman who has literally taken Jesus hostage as a way of getting help. And that's not the way you're supposed to do it, but the purpose of this story is to show the vast mercy of the Virgin Mary, who steps in and helps people in all sorts of situations, especially when they are not behaving at their best. Uh, She doesn't always do this. There's another story in this compilation of the Virgin Mary going through the monk's dormitory and blessing everybody except for a monk that is sleeping too lazily. So he's probably left his feet out of the covers or he's left his belt undone. So she's not always the most forgiving, but in most miracle stories, it's the Virgin Mary who will forgive you for the most egregious sins as long as your heart is in the right place, including kidnapping the little statue of her son. This next story shows that, kind of like the monk who slept in a way that was too disheveled for the Virgin Mary, some of the people living in the monastery didn't always live up to the standards that they hoped to. And so this next story is one of a, an abbot who's giving a sermon when some of the people who are listening stop listening and fall asleep. When the abbot Javard, the predecessor of the present abbot, was preaching to us in the chapter house on a certain festival, several of the brethren, chiefly lay brothers, went to sleep, and some even began to snore. He noticed this and cried out, Listen, brethren, listen, I have something new and important to tell you. There was once a king named Arthur. There he stopped and then went on, You see, my brothers, to how sad a pass we have come. When I was speaking to you about God, you fell asleep. But as soon as I began a secular story, you all woke up and began to listen with eager ears. I myself was present at that sermon. But the devil uses somnolence to tempt and hinder not only spiritual persons, but those also who are in the world. So lots of people who are writing about monastic life in the Middle Ages, are always telling the brothers to stop falling asleep. They have to get up in the morning when it's time to worship, and they're always falling asleep. This is in part because they have to get up in the middle of the night to worship, but they do fall asleep sometimes, which is something that they are not supposed to be doing, even though they perk up at the sound of a King Arthur story, which I love as a fan of King Arthur myself. Caesarius was a Cistercian monk, and Cistercian monks, like a few other orders of monks, followed the rule of St. Benedict. That's how they ordered their days. That's how they decided what was important to wear and to carry and things like that. But the Cistercians followed the rule of St. Benedict to the letter. They were really strict about that. Even if they lived in places that had a slightly different climate, a colder climate than St. Benedict's Abbey in Monte Cassino, they really followed it strictly and kind of looked down on the other orders that had made modifications to the rule of St. Benedict. So here is a story that is probably a little bit of a dig at Benedictines and also a little bit of a dig at the French, but I think it's a funny story about fashion, uh, and so I thought I would share it with you. In France, a certain noble made repeated attacks upon a Benedictine monastery, and the abbot and brethren determined to send one of the monks to Philip, who was king at the time, to tell him of the knight's violence. A young man of noble birth was chosen as one who would have more weight with the king than any other because he was so highly connected. When he came before the king, he said, Sir, this noble without any provocation is harassing our monastery to our continual hurt and injury and is persecuting our brethren and household with many threats and insults. And our convent humbly prays your majesty that you will bear in mind your heavenly reward and restrain him from committing these great wrongs and compel him to make due reparation for his robberies. The king, after considering the carriage and the dress of the monk, said, Sir, who are you and what is your origin? And when the youth told him his father's name, the king answered, You are indeed of noble birth. And after the king had talked a little more, the monk added, Truly, sir, he carries off all our goods and has left us scarcely anything. To which the king replied, Truly, sir, that is plain enough in your leggings, for if he had left you any leather, they need not have been so tight. The nobler you are, the more humble you ought to be. Then after this rebuke, wishing to be kindly, he added, You must not be annoyed at my reproof, because I made it for your good. Go back to your monastery, and for the future, that noble shall trouble you no more. So I kind of like this. (laughs) In the middle of a storybook full of divine miracles, we have a little bit of a rebuke against a monk who is a little bit too fashionable, whose leggings are too tight. And there's actually a very similar story that comes right after this. Another person saying, wow, your monastery is poor because you can't afford to have more leather to create your leggings. (laughs) This is just an example of 
kind of the sense of humor that monks had, little digs against the French, against nobles, and against the Benedictines if you're a Cistercian monk. The rule of St. Benedict gives a whole list of things that are the only essential things that a monk needs, and that includes some bedding, it includes some clothes, it includes a knife, a stylus, and some tablets so he can make notes, and also a needle so he can do his own repairs. And because the Cistercians take this very seriously is perhaps why there are a couple of stories in here that have to do with monks carrying needles and what happens if you don't carry a needle. So because this is one of these things that is kind of so petty and small and such an everyday detail, these three stories are ones that I thought were worth bringing to you on a cold February day. Some time ago in the days of the Emperor Frederick, the grandfather of the reigning Frederick, one of the imperial abbeys fell vacant. Two men were elected, and when the monks could not agree, one of whom took a large sum of money which he had collected in the monastery and offered it to Frederick that he might take his part. The emperor took the money and gave his promise, and afterwards he learnt that the other candidate was a man of good life and simple and well-ordered, and he began to take counsel with his friends how he might get rid of the unworthy candidate and confirm the election of him who had been chosen for his virtues. And one of his counselors said to him, Sire, I have heard that every monk is bound by his rule to carry a needle. When you are sitting in the chapter house, say to that candidate of irregular life that you wish him to lend you his needle in order to take a splinter out of one of your fingers. And when he proves to have none, you will find an occasion of disallowing him owing to his irregularity. Now when this was done, and the man had no needle, the king said to the other, Sir, lend me your needle. And when he immediately produced it, perhaps having been forewarned, the emperor went on, You are a monk, upright in keeping the rules of your order, and so you are worthy of this great honor. I had intended to give the honor to your opponent, but his irregularity has shown him unworthy. He that is careless in that which is least will be careless in important matters. By such sophistry did the emperor get rid of the worldly wise monk and promote his simple brother to be abbot. And Caesarius' novice says, I did not know till now that there was so much virtue in a needle. And Caesarius says, It was not in the needle that the virtue lay, it was only the sign of virtue, that is, of humility in the monk. He carried it for the purpose of mending his garments if they became torn. And here's the second story. The Emperor Otto, the predecessor of the younger Frederick now reigning, was one day talking with three abbots of our order and wishing to make trial of them, he said to one, Lord Abbot, will you lend me your needle? When he replied, I have not one, sire, he asked the second, who also had none. But when the third was asked to produce his needle, the Emperor replied, You are a true monk. You see here an example of what I just said, that a needle may be a sign of virtue in a monk. And here's the third story. A certain religious told me a very terrible thing of a monk of our order which seems suitable to set down in this place for an example. When he was in health, he refused to carry a needle according to the custom of monks, or rather he scorned to do so. But when he was lying in his last agony, a demon appeared bearing in his hand a blazing needle of the length of a human body and hurled it at him, saying, Because you refuse in health to carry a needle, take this one now that you are about to die and he, relating this vision to the bystanders, terrified them all. The novice says, If this be so, I shall be careful for the future not to go without my needle. Caesarea says, A monk ought not to neglect any rule of his order unless compelled by necessity. So it's a very common thing for demons to find the instrument in which you have been sinning and throw it at you or use it against you in some way. This happens a lot in miracle stories. And this one is a vision of somebody who Caesarius has known or has heard of from a certain religious. So this is something that would be kind of a terrifying example, as he says, for all of the monks who are listening. This last story that I want to share with you is one that is about the monastic diet in a way, except for it's a miracle story, which you will see in a second. Uh, monks were not supposed to eat the meat of quadrupeds, St. Benedict said. And if you listen to my podcast with John Wyatt Greenlee on eels, you'll hear him say that this is because uh, the meat of quadrupeds was supposed to make you think lusty thoughts, in part because I think it made you a little bit warm in your body to eat the meat of quadrupeds, but also because, as John Wyatt says, it makes you think about sex because 
we can see how four-legged creatures have sex and that makes you think about it and then that leads you to temptation. And as I say in my new book, it's hard enough to be a monk without having temptation at every meal. So it's better, says St. Benedict, to not actually eat the meat of quadrupeds. So monks would be eating a mostly vegetarian diet, but they would also be eating things like seafood, a lot of bread and ale as well. And in a time like now, which is Lent, they would only be eating seafood, which is why, again, if you listen to John Wyatt speak on my podcast about eels, you'll know that monks were eating a lot of eels at this time to get around the whole quadrupeds thing. But here is an example of a monk who ate quadrupeds and yet everything turned out. And this is just a really cute story that I hope you enjoy. Dom Vito, a Cistercian abbot and afterwards a cardinal, was once sent to Cologne to confirm an election which had been made on behalf of Otto against Philip and brought back from thence a story of holy simplicity, both amusing and amazing. He said that a house of our order was situated on the estates of a certain powerful noble, and this tyrant, who feared not God, neither regarded man, often vexed the monastery in various ways. He took of its corn, wine, and cattle as much and as often as he pleased, and he left to the brethren just as much as he chose. He acted in this way for so long that from habit his conduct became a sort of law, and the convent, after making many complaints to no purpose, gave up in despair and submitted. But one day he carried off the greater part of their cattle and ordered them to be taken to his castle. When this became known, the abbot and brethren were very much troubled and debated long what they ought to do. Finally, they determined that someone should go to the castle, at least to let the noble know what sort of a reward he was heaping up for himself, and if possible, it should be the abbot. But he replied, I will not go, because we shall get no advantage from warning him, but shall only be beating the air. When the prior and the cellarer had excused themselves in similar fashion, the abbot said, Is there anyone here who is willing to make this journey? All were silent except one who was inspired from on high, and promptly answered, Let that monk go, mentioning by name an old brother of extremely simple character. The monk was summoned, was asked if he would go to the castle on this errand. He agreed and was dispatched. As he went out of the room, he said to the abbot in the great simplicity of his heart, Father, if he should offer to restore me any portion of the herd, shall I accept it or not? The abbot replied, If you can get anything back, take it in the name of the Lord. Half a loaf is better than no bread. He departed and came to the castle, bringing to the tyrant the message of the abbot and brethren, together with their petition. The tyrant made a mock of his discourse and said scoffingly, Sir, wait a little until you have dined, and then I will give you your answer. At the dinner hour he was given a place at the common table and the ordinary food, to wit flesh in abundance, was set before him, as before the rest. The holy man, remembering the words of his abbot and not doubting that the flesh so lavishly placed before him was a part of the monastery cattle, ate as much of the flesh as he could that he might not break the law of obedience. The lord of the castle, who was sitting opposite with his wife, was much impressed that the monk should be eating flesh so heartily, and when dinner was over, he called him aside and said, Tell me, good sir, is your convent accustomed to eat flesh? When the other replied, Certainly not. The Lord added, What do they do when they go outside? Neither inside the convent, said he, nor outside do they eat flesh. Then the tyrant asked, Why then did you eat all this flesh today? The monk answered, When my abbot sent me here, he ordered me to get back as much of our cattle as I could. Therefore I could not refuse, and because I felt sure that the meat set before me belonged to my monastery, and also because I feared that that would be all I could recover, viz, as much as I could take away through my teeth, I ate for the sake of obedience that I might not return wholly empty. And because God does not reject the simple, neither will he help the evildoers, this noble, when he heard what the monk said, was moved by his simplicity, or rather by the Holy Spirit who spoke by the mouth of the old man, and recognized the warning and replied, Wait for me here. I will go and take counsel with my wife as to what I shall do for you. And when he came to her and told her in order the words of the old monk, he added, I fear the swift vengeance of God upon me if I should now repel this man so simple and so upright. She replied in similar fashion that she was also troubled by the same thought. Then he went back to the old man and said, Good father, for the sake of your holy simplicity which has moved me to pity, I will restore to your monastery all that is still left of your cattle, and so far as I can, I will give you satisfaction for all the injuries I have done you, and from this day I will never trouble you again. 
At these words, the old man thanked him and returned joyfully to the monastery with the cattle and to the great astonishment of the abbot and the brethren repeated the words of the noble. From the peace that they enjoyed thenceforward, they learned by experience how great is the virtue of simplicity. See what an example you have of how an act which is sometimes wrong in itself may become good and full of light by reason of a single eye, a good intention. In truth, this monk by eating flesh in the castle would have sinned if he had not been justified in his simplicity, and the result showed not only that there was no sin in his act, but even that it was meritorious. So there's the story of a monk who takes the cattle back to the monastery in his stomach as a way of fulfilling one of his three main vows, which are poverty, chastity, and obedience. He's doing his best to obey the abbot's ideas, even if perhaps that is not how the abbot meant for them to be followed. And this is an example that Caesarius is telling us of how it's important to have good intentions and that the intentions are what is important. These are just a few of my favorite stories from the dialogue on miracles by Caesarius, and I hope you've enjoyed them. They're just a little glimpse into the ideas that a Cistercian monk thought were important to share with novices and with other people to kind of get at the type of information that Christians needed at this time in order to perform their faith well. And you'll see that there's a lot of these examples in which people are falling on their faces and maybe not doing things right, and they are forgiven for this because the intent is really the main thing. I mean, if you're a monk, you're going to be living to a higher standard. You need to remember to keep your needle with you at all times. But the main point of Caesarius' stories are to do your best to be contrite and to confess if you've made a mistake and then everything should be fine with you as long as you are trying your hardest to live up to the Christian ideal. So I hope you've enjoyed these stories. It's fun to have medieval story time every once in a while and I will give you the link so that you can read more of these on your own. This translation of Caesarius's Dialogue on Miracles was done by Henry von Essen Scott and C. C. Swinton Bland for Harcourt Brace in 1929, and you can find it for free on the Internet Archive at archive.org. You can find the full URL in the show notes on Medievalist.net. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. Let's do this week, Peter. Hey, hey. Well, this week we have something that all our gardeners will enjoy. Uh, Lucy Lamonnier is writing about medieval farmers and how they try to keep pests away. So there's like medieval versions of pesticide and insecticide. And if that didn't work, you might be able to get your like local bishop to send out an official order against bugs and vermin to leave your crops alone. So we've got that. Uh, that was a really fun read. Plus, we've got pieces on the medieval version of cancel culture and a 15th century book of hours that's about to go up for auction and could get like $2.5 million. Wow. So I should start getting my pennies together is what you're saying, right? <laughs> yes. Let's make a joint bid. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we could get half a page, right? No, probably not. All right. Well, thanks, Peter. We will look forward to reading those articles. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com, whether you've been with us for 99 episodes or just one. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast can get access to awesome stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. To become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. It's almost March, and that means that it's time for our new session of the Medieval Masterclass for Creators. This is a six-week online course that I developed to help people creating fictional medieval worlds by showing them some of the practical aspects of medieval life. You'll learn about cooking with Beth Rogers, combat with Ken Monshine, blacksmithing with Tom Timbrell, textiles with Katrin Konya, and daily life with yours truly. You also have the opportunity to connect with other creators for inspiration and motivation. And you get the chance to ask me anything, anytime. To find out more about the Medieval Masterclass for Creators, please visit MedievalMasterclass.com. The next session begins March 5th. And speaking of awesome events coming up, don't forget to tune in next week for the 100th episode of the Medieval Podcast. It is hard to believe, isn't it? I'll have some of your favorite guests from the last 100 episodes stopping by to say hello virtually and to give us all sorts of little nuggets of information that they've uncovered in the time since we last heard from them. 
I'll also have a fun little announcement for all of you bibliophiles out there, although I seem to keep getting complaints on social media that I'm making people's bookshelves way too full. Hashtag sorry not sorry. And speaking of social media, for everything from growing plants to saving souls, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can follow me, Danielle Sapolsky, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening. And have yourself an amazing day.